Good evening and welcome Corky and Marjorie to talk to us about Doc Adams. Uh, we titled this a brief look at the life of this baseball pioneer and not a person questioned the misspelling on baseball to the 19th century spelling. I kept waiting for someone to say you spelled baseball wrong and my spell check doesn't like it at all. You know, it's, it's always trying to get corrected. Um, little intro here. Uh, Corky's going to do uh, the presentation he's prepared, and it's, it's interesting. He, he says he started playing uh, vintage baseball about 12 years ago, and as he started to play that, he started studying 19th uh, century baseball, and he came across uh, a gentleman by the name of Doc Adams, and as he looked at things, it seemed every time you looked at something in the uh, 1850s and 60s, Doc seemed to be involved in everything. Uh, in many, many different ways. Uh, he played the game, he umpired, he made the baseballs, he oversee the making of the bats. Uh, he recruited players, organized clubs, and even played a part in the development of the rules of the game, including setting the bases at the 90 feet. And he is credited for creating the shortstop position. Uh, so, uh, so he started to learn more about it. Now he wants to talk about it and tell us about him. Um, uh, and then also on the line is Marjorie Adams, and Marjorie, who now resides in Connecticut, is the great granddaughter of Doc Adams. And uh, Marjorie spent the last 10 years or so getting the word out about Doc in order to help get him in his rightful place in the Hall of Fame as a pioneer for what he did. Uh, I heard you, Marjorie, on the uh, podcast with the, um, with what's his name, uh, Dan from the- oh, Dan, oh yeah. It, yep. he, it, you you were excellent. He's a great <laughs> person for very relaxed, very good at conversation and knows his stuff. So so I I, I heard that and, and that's what reminded me to set this up again after Corky mentioned it to me in November. So well, thank you. That's very nice of you. That was a lot of fun. Yeah. Dan's a great guy. Dan was a great guy. Yeah. With the I, Shoeless I, Joe Jackson Museum. Yeah. Yeah. He's he he did a great job. Uh, so from there, I'm going to turn it over to Corky and Marjorie to talk about Doc Adams. Great, thanks, Dennis. Uh, just out of curiosity, if if you can, uh, if you've heard of Doc Adams before this, just kind of put your hand up in front of the camera. I'm just curious um, where we're at here. So it's about half and half. Um, and and Dennis did a, a wonderful job of the intro, and so it, it'll cut my presentation in half now because he's basically covered about half of it for me. Uh, but I, I wanna say thank you for, for allowing me to come and, uh, and, and Marjorie as well. Uh, just for some background before I get into the slideshow, um, th this is really a pitch that Marjorie put together uh, for presentations probably what, four or five years ago, Marjorie, you started on yes. mm -hmm. this main one? The first She's one was at the Sabre Convention in New York. In New York, okay. And she has been kind of- 2015, enough, uh, I think. Yeah, so when we, when we met via Facebook and she found out my interest in Doc Adams, you know, we kind of hit it off and she's been kind enough to share a lot of this information with me through, you know, verbally and also through the, the great website that she has that we'll talk about at the end. A lot of great information out there. And it's really given me uh, an even better appreciation for what Doc has done for the game. And it, it's incensed it's, it me to to keep digging and keep learning more. Um, if I'm not sure if I'm on the, the speaker screen when I talk, but behind me, I've got some of my Doc Adams memorabilia. The, the framed picture is a framed replica of the laws of baseball, the rules from 1857 that Doc penned. Uh, we'll get into that uh, in, in the presentation. I've got a book that was written by Doc's father, a math book. He was, is one of the things that he did. I've got some baseballs that I've made, uh, you know, as Doc being someone that made baseballs, I too make baseballs and actually they're used in games. I sell them to teams across the country to play the 19th century game. And then on this side, I've got an 1859 New York Knickerbocker replica uniform that I wear when I'm doing live presentations for things about Doc. And I've worn it sometimes when I've umpired games. Uh, I had it made specially uh, as a replica, replica from a picture from 1859. So 
with that, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen and get into. Oh, may I go back one here? Oh. There we go. There we go. Oops, I keep clicking the wrong button. So this is uh, the, the cover page and it's a, a picture of, of Doc. But one thing I, I like to focus on here is, you know, most people know John Thorne as the official historian of Major League Baseball and he's bought into Doc. And so once a guy like John Thorne buys in, uh, you kind of have to believe that there's something there. And, I, and hopefully at the end of this presentation, uh, you'll all agree with, with what John Thorne has said here. So Doc comes from a pretty good stock. His father pictured there on the left, Daniel Adams, uh, a medical doctor. Uh, as I mentioned, I've got one of the books he, writ he had uh, written, but he was an author of math and accounting textbooks. He was also very respected, uh, influential in the community. He promoted the abolition of slavery. And while some of you may not approve of this, he was also involved in the temperance movement, um, which eliminating alcohol isn't always something that a lot of people like, but he, he was uh, involved in that as well. He was elected to the New Hampshire legislature and he was a president of the medical society. So, you know, Doc's father, quite ambitious in his medical and also uh, politics. His mother, who was the daughter of Isaac Mulliken, also was a medical doctor, Isaac was. And Isaac served one year as a Continental Army physician in Boston in 1775, part of the revolution. So as you can see, uh, Doc's parents, good stock. Uh, and I think you'll see as we go along that uh, Doc follows along in those footsteps. This is a uh, reference to a letter that Doc wrote to his sister. And in the, in, or I'm sorry, yeah, from the sister that wrote to Doc, and the quote that we've got highlighted at the bottom uh, kind of gives us a little look into Doc's interest in, in sports, if nothing else, uh, the bat and the ball. And so she, he had given his sister a bat and a ball to play with, and she was just letting him know she hasn't had time to do it. Yeah. Oh. Okay. Um, I just want to interject here. This is the only evidence we have uh -huh. among all the family papers of anything that Doc wrote or was written to him about baseball. Now, I'm this could have been any number of a va variables of bat and ball games. So we don't know exactly what he was referring to, but it does show his early interest in sports. And this was six years before Abner Doubleday invented it in Cooperstown. <laughs> And you can see at Doc's age 17, he's still in college and it's quite a ways away from uh, when he comes to New York City to get involved with baseball. So there was some early interest there. So in 1835, he graduated from Yale uh, and then in 38 graduated from Harvard Medical School. And in 1839, he moved to New York City to set up his medical practice. And that's the time where he got involved with baseball and it was with the, what was the New York Baseball Club back then one of the early clubs. Uh, he was also at that time when he got to New York City appointed a vaccine physician. He volunteered as a physician at the New York Infirmary for the Poor. He helped during the cholera outbreak, which if you remember, kind of hit the US in the 1830s and kept going and going. And so when Doc gets to New York City, they're still doing that. He's helping with that cholera outbreak. And he was also involved in many health and hygiene movements in New York City. So you can kind of see his following in the footsteps of his parents in that medical uh, area. Now this, this letter is really interesting to me and I don't, I don't like saying one single person you know, is the reason for any one thing happening, especially when it comes to baseball. But the part that gets highlighted here and I put in red, uh, there's a reference here from Doc's father mentioning, you know, that there was a proposition for Doc to move to Springfield for whatever reason, that's in Massachusetts. And so again, this is, you know, before he really gets strongly involved in baseball and it kind of makes you wonder, you know, 
if Doc goes to Springfield, you know, who, who's that guy? Who's the guy that does what Doc did to keep this game going? Um, so that was just a really interesting letter uh, or information in that letter that, uh, that, that uh, kind of makes you think. So this is now, um, as I mentioned earlier, in 1839, Doc had started with the New York Baseball Club. And then you can see here in September of 1845, he now joins the New York Knickerbocker Baseball Club. Um, it was just founded just before that, a month before Doc joined. And then already in 1846, you know, less than a year later, he's elected vice president. Then in June of 1846, uh, there's a game that happens in Elysian Fields in, in Hoboken, New Jersey. And the reason I mention that is the scorecard off to the right uh, is the scorecard from that game. And if you look at the bottom slide, the second name down, that's Doc Adams. That's, uh, he was involved in that game. Now, this just so happens to be the scorecard that uh, was stolen, actually, from the New York Library. So they're able to get uh, a copy of this before that was stolen. Um, and now, we referenced the Knicks playing here at Elysian Fields, but they also played uh, in Harlem at the Red Tavern House. They played at Madison Square Park in some open fields nearby. And one other interesting note in the upper score sheet on the top right, and it's hard to read, but it's a reference to a fine for Davis uh, for swearings. He got a fine for six cents. And I just, I, that's, that's interesting to me. Uh, I know they used fines back in the day to kind of collect club dues and whatnot, but it also shows that they just weren't looking for uh, or, or didn't want swearing to be a part of a game. It's a gentleman's game. Yeah, I just want to point out, this was a gentleman's game and there were very strict rules about behavior and conduct. This was more about playing than playing for competition. This was for fun and exercise. Yeah, and that's for those that follow 19th century baseball, that, that gentleman's game playing for fun started to turn probably, you know, in the early to mid 1850s. And so this era now we're 10 years before that, everybody's still playing for fun and for exercise. So uh, that, that's a good point. So here we have uh, what's known, I guess, as the, the only first person account of the memoirs of Doc. And this actually was uh, a shortened version that was published in the St. Paul, Minnesota Daily Globe in 1895. And the full version would then come out a year later in the Sporting News in 1896. It's, a, it's an article, if, if you are interested in more about Doc or even uh, the early game, this is a, an outstanding read. Uh, you can find the full article from the Sporting News on the Doc Adams page and we'll, we'll get you to that link at the end of the presentation. Uh, but I highly recommend you go out to that link, uh, out to the website find the Sporting News version and read this. It's, it's really, really good article. Part of that article, he, he and this is a, a quote, I should say out of that article. And this, this one is, is very important to me. Uh, and it also really gives Doc credit for keeping the game alive. And, and what the, the point of this quote really is, there were people that didn't always want to go play. And th there was good reasons that it was hard for them to get to places. If you were going to the Elysian fields, you know, you were going to have to take a ride, a boat ride. You're going to have to walk up a big hill. Um, if you were playing over in Madison Park, uh, you would take a, a, a train and then you'd have to walk a long distance. So what Doc's doing here or, or mentioning here is that he really had to get after people to show up. Uh, if people don't show up, you know, you're not going to have a team, you're not going to have the games. And so it's, this was, this is really, really good, important part uh, to show the impact that Doc had on the game. And then this next quote that he says, it really explains to you why he did it. At the very end, you'll see, but my love for the game led me to persevere. And that's, that's important to me because as I 
do this with my own vintage clubs. Uh, and I, just for information, I run the Roosters Baseball Club out of Rochester, Minnesota. We play by the rules of 1860. And a lot of the stuff that I see Doc doing are things that I kind of find myself having to do as well with recruiting players. Like I said before, I make the baseballs. Uh, a friend of mine uh, makes bats that I, I help him get the bat style set up. So a lot of these things I'm trying to do as, as Doc did. Um, and so I understand when he says things like that uh, because it's, that's how much I love the game as well is I just wanna keep that history alive of uh, what was going on in this era. So not only did Doc keep the game going by recruiting and encouraging others, he had a hand uh, in the equipment. And we, we talked about that a little bit. Um, for six or seven years, I made all the baseballs myself, not only for our club, but for other clubs. Uh, and that's Doc talking about it. And, and we'll see, I, I believe we have a, a page later, we talk a little bit about um, who he gets to help him do that. He's, he's got an English saddler that comes along, helps him put covers on the ball. But he also oversaw the turning of the bats. And, uh, and, and they had restrictions on the bat, not as tight as we might have today in a modern game, but they did have a barrel restriction, um, but they didn't have a length restriction. He and, would um, go around the city to the various furniture makers and choose the wood. He would check the wood and then he would stand over the furniture maker who would turn the bat and Doc would make him get it to the right taper and length that he wanted. And, and for a little history here, for those that aren't into the 19th century, there was no restriction on the length of the bat until 1867. And they, they put a maximum length of 42 inches. So can you imagine what people might have been swinging before they put a restriction on the length. That, that to me, just that, that fact of a, of a bat restriction really <laughs> opens my eyes to what those guys uh, were doing back in this era. And just a little plug for me, the, the picture of the baseballs here, those are ones that I made. Uh, Marjorie's original presentation didn't have that. I snuck those in on my own, um, just to kind of give you guys an idea of, of what, they, what they look like from that pattern, that stitching pattern, what's called a modern, modernly called a lemon peel or a four petal ball. So Doc joined the Knicks in 1845. Uh, he became vice president in 1846, as we saw in an earlier slide. And now 1847, he becomes president. So he's only two years in with the Knickerbockers and he's already president. Uh, he, he uh, as, as Dennis mentioned in the introduction, he created and developed a shortstop position. Now, when he developed it, it is not the shortstop position that we all know from the modern game. It was really developed to be kind of a relay or a cutoff position for the players in the outfield. Uh, it, back then, a ball was, was pretty light. It could be hit a good distance, but it couldn't be thrown as far as it could be hit. So Doc would then be one that would run from his position towards the outfield, take the relay and get the ball back in. And it wasn't until probably five or six years later, uh, Dickie Pierce started playing it a little more closer to the modern uh, era shortstop, but he actually played in front of the base path. So he was actually just to the right of the pitcher. And then later on, they, they moved back behind the base path to get a little further away from the pitcher. So it was a, it was a position that, uh, that developed over time. And, and Doc was accredited for creating that uh, position. And if you look at the insert, you know, we, we don't talk about Doc a lot from a plane prowess standpoint. And there's not a lot of research that I've found where, you know, he's not like the Mike Trout of today or anything like that. But this little uh, blurb here from the Porter Spirit of the Times back in 56 does have some good things to say about him, which I, I enjoy seeing um, because, you know, he's 
he's really a, a pioneer of the game and we know him better for the rules part of the game. But as a player now, it's good to know that, uh, that he was a decent player. And, and it's fun to read the way that they wrote these words back in the day, you know, um, the, the, the verbiage that they use. It's, it's interesting to me. We have a little note from my grandfather saying that shortstop was his favorite position. Yeah. And I think you, I think you may be the one that told me he played every position except the pitcher. That Sorry. is correct. At, at some that point is correct. during his career. So that's, 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 uh, it's interesting as well. So this is just three game accounts or four actually uh, of the early, early games where doc was involved and the, the middle one I, I like talking about, again, is for, for people that don't follow the 19th century game. Prior to the, to the laws being written of 1857, uh, games weren't nine innings. They were played to 21. And this is just an example where they, had, they got- 21 the, runs, not innings. Yeah, 21 runs. Thank you. Not 21 innings. But you can Carry see that they got through 12 innings. The game was tied and they ran out of daylight. So uh, for those of you that follow cricket, you know, that happens quite often. Games go into the next day. Um, I don't know if there is a article the following day or following week where this game ever got finished, but I just like to talk about uh, the game being played 21 runs back in that day. So as we get a little bit into the baseball years, um, in 1854, there was a convention, the first baseball convention, but there were only three teams back then. And those teams, you know, got together and tried to come up with some, uh, some, some rules that they could all play by. And then the picture here is some buttons from, uh, from Doc's Knickerbocker uniform. Um, and it's thought here that it wasn't necessarily a game day uniform thing, but more of a special event. Uh, type of a button that they would have worn to a more of a, I don't want to say an uptown affair, but not necessarily uh, within a game environment, but they are part of the family uh, private collection uh, that came from Doc. So th those, are, those are pretty neat. They are probably the oldest known provenanced piece of baseball uniform in existence. So in, yes, in 18, up. <laughs> I'm sorry, I, I interrupted there, Marjorie. That's was, all right. I just wanted to make a joke. They are lat, locked up in the bank. Probably where they should be. Yep. So in 1856, uh, Doc had proposed to the, that they take a poll for an interest uh, in a convention of all the clubs together. Now, by this time, instead of just three clubs, you know, they were up to probably somewhere from 16 to 20 clubs. So they took a poll and then they decided to uh, get together in 1857, have a convention of all these clubs to standardize the rules. And Doc was elected president of that convention. And from this convention uh, is where we get what's known as the laws of baseball. And we're gonna get into that. So the laws of baseball are basically the rules of the game uh, starting for the 1857 season. And what you're seeing on the screen are three of the four pages. And these are handwritten by Doc. So these, and, and some of you may have seen this uh, in the news, um, but they first sold in 1998 at a, at a Sotheby auction. The, these laws, these documents were mixed in with a bunch of maps uh, and the gentleman that bought them just happened to like maps and he also happened to like baseball. So he spent $12,000 uh, and then ended up putting the laws of baseball, these documents into a drawer. And then about 2015, he took them out uh, and he decided, well, let's go get these things checked out. So he brought in John Thorne uh, they brought in a handwriting uh, analysis person and they verified that these were indeed the ones that Doc Adams scribed. Uh, 
um, then you can see uh, the quote from John Thorne in the middle, um, referring to them, uh, the Dead Sea, Dead sea Scrolls, uh, baseball basically. And he then, the gentleman that bought these for $12,000, once he got them verified, turned around and sold them for $3.26 million. Uh, they were on display uh, at the Library of Congress. I know two years ago, I was able to get there and see them. It, it's, it's pretty neat history. Um, but these are the original rules, first set of rules codified by all the clubs. I and mean, that is a very, very important thing. Now, it, what's important here, at least to me, is the last time Doc was up for the Hall of Fame, these had not come to, to surface. So the hope now is with these coming out, we know Doc's involvement, we know all the things that he's, he's been involved with that that's what's gonna put him over the edge. There is a fourth page that's missing. Um, so not, not all of the laws of 1857 are shown here. Uh, a gentleman by the name of William Grinnell did make his own copy, he copied him you know, verbatim of what Doc had written. And so his, his fourth copy is available. Um, but the one of the things that's on the missing page that Doc was, uh, one of the rules Doc was, uh, had, a, had a strong hand in was getting the game to be nine men per side and the game being nine innings. Again, you know, we mentioned we were playing to 21 runs before uh, and the, 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 time, the time limit, you know, was kind of a, unknown because you didn't know when the game was really ever going to end. What's interesting though is the first vote they had to put these laws through actually had it at seven men and seven innings and that's what was going to get passed. You know Doc was a, an advocate for nine men nine innings uh, but so was a gentleman by the name of Lewis Wadsworth who at the very end before the final uh, the final uh, vote went out argued strongly for nine men and nine innings, and that got passed in the final version. So again, a very important part of the game, uh, how different the game would be with just seven men and playing for seven innings. Um, I think some might argue today uh, with all the TV commercials and all that, maybe seven innings is enough, but uh, nine men, nine, nine innings was a very key part of the laws of baseball of 1857. Another key one was setting the bases at 30 yards, uh, which we know is 90 feet. Prior to this, uh, the bases were set basically as 42 paces from first base to third base, and then 42 paces from home to second. And if you think about all the people on this call, if each one of us were to march off 42 paces, we would probably have 42 different <laughs> baseball diamonds. And so getting an actual standardized distance of 30 yards or 90 feet uh, was really, really important. And I know I've seen people talking about and discuss how close some of those plays are at first base. You know, if you're at paces and that thing is at 89 feet for some reason, a lot of people are gonna have a higher batting average. And if it ended up at 91 feet with the paces, people are gonna lose five or six points off their batting average. So that 90 feet turned out to be really, really a uh, uh, magical number uh, to, to set, that, uh, set that in the rules. And they also, in the same way, they had paces set off for the base paths. They had paces set off as the distance from home to where the pitcher pitched. And they got that standardized from uh, 25 paces to 15 yards or 45 feet, which is the distance they pitched from in this era. Can, Corky, can you go to the next slide, please? Oh, you're right. I should have, I should have hit that button. Thank you. I, this, is, this is where he wrote it down, the 90 feet. And then there's the paces for the pitcher. Yes. I get so excited talking, I forget to press the buttons. That's all right. I didn't want to interrupt you, but I had to uh, jump in. That's what, you know, he always... Glad to have you on. Now, he also specified some uniform standards. He also had, they also had laws for the bats and the balls. I kind of mentioned the bats. Uh, they didn't have a lot of restrictions, but uh, the ones that they had um, 
they wanted to make sure they were followed. As far as the ball, the ball changed quite a bit over time uh, where the bat didn't change as much. The ball got smaller and smaller as time went on. So in 1854, uh, a ball would have been almost 11 inches in circumference, which is you know, closer to the size of a softball. And it goes all the way to 1872 where the ball is at the size it is today. It's between nine and nine and a quarter inches in circumference. And the ball has not changed in size or weight since 1872. The, the thing that changed that makes the biggest difference is that in the late seventies and into the early to mid eighties, they started using machines to make the ball. So it got harder uh, as, as they started using machines. And that's, uh, that's really the only difference. So in 1858, uh, Doc was elected chairman of that rules and regulations committee for the National Association of Baseball Players. And you can see, uh, it, this is again from that interview from the Sporting News. He was a strong advocate uh, for the fly game. And again, for uh, I'll say these because I don't know what all the knowledge you guys have on the 19th century game, but the fly game uh, started in 1865. Prior to that season, you could catch a ball on one bounce and put the batter out. And, and Doc thought that was for children and it, everyone should have to catch a ball uh, on the fly. Don't let it bounce to catch it to get the batter out. Well, that's uh, because there were no gloves. Yep. Yeah, and a lot of new clubs had formed. Baseball went through a growth spurt in the mid 1850s. There were 14 regular voting clubs at the first meeting in 1858. And there were 12 junior clubs. They were allowed to, to attend, but they weren't allowed to vote because they, had, they were too new. They were too inexperienced. But that shows you the growth of baseball in New York City in such a relatively short time. But these new clubs weren't used to catching the ball on, on the fly and there were a lot of hand injuries. So one of the things that catching it on one bounce did, yes, it made it less manly, which the older clubs objected to, but it was easier on the hands because catchers mitts and gloves didn't come along for about another oh, almost 20 years before they showed up. So that's the reason that there was such a controversy with the fly game. Yeah, and I've, I've been in some discussion groups, you know, the, in 18, the, the convention of 64, when the fly rule passed, one of the reasons it passed was because the number of new teams had started to slow down because of the war. If they would have waited another year to vote on this after the war was over and the boom of clubs starting to form in, you know, 65, 66 and 67, they may not have gotten that pass because all these new clubs, for the same reason Marjorie just said, would have said, hey, we're not, we're not ready for that. So they were, the fly game proponents were fortunate uh, that it passed when it did. Now, Doc was the chairman of this committee in, until 62 when he retired. Um, so he, he wasn't part of it when it finally did pass to the fly game, but I'm sure he was very happy when he, uh, when he heard that it did. Now, this is a historical game for Doc, um, this, the third game of this series, I should say. Uh, the Fashion Race Course Games was a, was a three-game series uh, considered the first all-star game. Uh, it was the best of New York against the best of Brooklyn, and it was the, the first time that they played in an enclosed stadium and first time that they charged admission, and there was over, they say, over 10,000 people at the game. Uh, the money that they raised... Uh, took in for that event, uh, went to, uh, the proceeds went to a widow's fund of fallen firemen. And this, this uh, fashion race course field, if you will, uh, for those of you that are familiar with New York City, it's about a mile and a half from where the current city field is. I believe that's where the Mets play. <laughs> Now, Doc served as an umpire for the third game of the series, and that's a picture of the game ball from that event. It's at the Baseball Hall of Fame. 
In, it uh, was the first time that the umpire called men out on non-swinging strikes. It was a brand new rule that had just been passed at the convention that year. And Doc was one of the first um umpires to use it. It wasn't very popular and it wasn't used very much until later, but it he was just about the first umpire to use it at the game. Yeah, so, so prior to 58, no balls and strikes were called in baseball and the game dragged on. And so to, to discourage batters from standing there and letting all these good pitches go by so runners on base could advance to the next base or what we would call today stealing, um, good pitches would go by. And so finally they put into the rule book, uh, if, you, if you keep doing that, the umpires are gonna be allowed to call strikes. And then in 1864, they started let the umpires call balls because the pitchers started pitching out constantly uh, to try and catch those runners stealing. And so they had to put a rule in for that. So that's the progress of the game. Oh, go back one. You, you missed a couple, Corky. Did I? You missed several. Goodness, there are a whole bunch that are lost. There are about eight or nine that are, oh, sorry. Sorry, I confused. My apologies. I was going to say, this, you have the next one on. Sorry. You're right. Sorry. It looked like something else. Yeah. So this is uh, from, the, from the front page of the New York Times. Um, the, and it's a story about that fashion race course game. And it is what we're hoping or what we think is the first time that a baseball event made the front page of the New York Times. And so um, anytime this gets presented to a Sabre group, we always ask, has anybody <laughs> heard anything different um, to verify it if it is or isn't? Because right now uh, it's, it's something that we do believe is the first time uh, on the front page of the New York Times. So it was a big thing back then. And you can see as the, at the bottom right, it pops out that uh, Doc Adams was the umpire of that event. So this is a, uh, one of the oldest known photos uh, of two clubs that gathered after a game. And this is uh, the New York Knickerbockers and the Brooklyn Excelsiors. Where the red arrow is fourth from the left, that's Doc Adams. Uh, two over from Doc Adams is Harry Wright. Again, for those of you that follow 19th century baseball, he's a very well-known and a very good baseball player. Uh, he, he, he was a cricket player as well. And then if you see the umpire towards the center there in the top hat and go three over, another rather famous player, Joe Leggett, uh, is in this picture as well. So 1862, uh, Doc resigns uh, from the New York Knickerbockers. You know, he was, he was married the year before. He was 47, his wife was 33. Um, they were expecting a child and that's kind of the thought as to why Doc decided to hang up the cleats and, and move on to, uh, to, to be a, a family. Unfortunately, she would lose that baby about six weeks after he resigned and she almost died, but uh, eventually she was all right. They would lose one other baby before they had four children that survived. The youngest was my grandfather, born when Doc was 60. Yeah. So in this picture, um, there's at least three original Knickerbockers. Uh, in the back row on the far left is Duncan Curry. The back row far right is William H. Tucker. And in the back row in the middle is Henry Anthony, uh, all original Knickerbockers. Um, some, some more maybe famous players you may have heard of. One of the better catchers of the time in the front row on the far left is Charles DeBost. And then to the right of Doc, uh, in this picture, and Doc is the second one from the left seated, um, kind of looks like a midget next to that giant DeBose. Um, that's James White Davis, another rather famous Knickerbocker. So when, when Doc uh, retired, he was made an honorary member of his club, and they gave him uh, an award called the Nestor of Baseball Players. And this is a, a letter uh, from 
James White Davis uh, to Doc, you know, recognizing him as the Nestor. And what's interesting um, in the in the bottom right of the quote, uh, he he mentions to Doc, even though Doc is retired, playing commences on the 21st, as in, you know, feel free to change your mind and come back. Now, for those that aren't familiar with the term uh, Nestor, uh, basically, it is the king of, he was the king of ancient Greece uh, and known as a wise advisor. Um, and if you want to see the full text, part of that is pulled out. If you want to see the full text of that scroll, again, we'll, we'll direct you to the Doc Adams website at the end and you can see that, see that entire uh, scroll. Uh, the hand-lettered so scroll was sent to him the following year, and the original is about 18 by 23, to give you an idea of how big it is. Yeah, but it, it, uh, it, does, it does show just how much they thought of Doc uh, to give him that, uh, that award. So now we'll get a little bit into his post-baseball years. Um, he moved to Ridgefield, Connecticut after baseball. And you can see there in that quote at the top that, you know, his marriage was the crowning achievement of his life. And it's, uh, it, it just shows how important family was to him. And we saw uh, some of that earlier as well. As, we as have Marjorie nothing. Said, we had this autobiography that Doc wrote for a Yale publication. It's not very long, but he does not mention baseball. He talks about his children, his wife, his life, but does not mention baseball. And then in 16, Someday I'll ask him why. 1865, he moved, moves to Ridgefield, Connecticut. Um, and you can see there it was uh, for health, health reasons for his mother. Again, he's looking out for his family. And in 1870, he was elected to the Connecticut State Legislature. And if you remember on the very first page, I talked about Doc's father uh, who was elected to the New Hampshire legislature. So again, kind of following in the family footsteps. In 1871, he became president, the first president of the Ridgefield Connecticut Savings Bank, uh, where he where he served uh, for the for actually he was there 15 years, 10 of those as as the president. The uh, bank still yeah. exists as the yeah. Fairfield County Bank. And Doc's photograph still hangs in the lobby of the bank. Yeah. And they use his name on the debit card. Being a tight-fisted old Yankee, I'm not sure how he'd approve, but that's all right. Makes me happy to see it there. So then in 1875, uh, Doc gets back into baseball a little bit. They have a, a Knickerbocker reunion game. And uh, the game was to celebrate 25 years of baseball for James White Davis. And they, they brought some of the, I guess what I'll call some of the old fogies back to play a game against the youngsters. The youngsters being the current roster of the New York Knickerbockers at that time. And at this time now, Doc is 60 years old. He's the second oldest player on the team. And it would be his last time for uh, getting together with the guys at Elysian Fields with the, with the Knickerbockers. As you can see here from the score, uh, game got a little out of hand. As you can see, the youngsters kind of took it to the old guys. So after five innings, uh, James White Davis calls the game, takes the old guys off the field, doesn't want them to get hurt, and he takes them out drinking, which was a natural, natural thing to do. Um, interesting uh, here, Henry Chadwick, for those of you that follow 19th century baseball will know Henry Chadwick as uh, a big uh, proponent and a pioneer as well in, in the rules of the game, but they brought Henry Chadwick, Chadwick back to umpire this game. Uh, after five innings, I'm not sure if he went drinking with the old guys or, or stayed and called the game with, uh, with the remaining young guys. I have another write-up on this game, and in there it says that James White Davis made them quit the game because the fog was coming in from the river. And he didn't want all these old duffers getting sick. So the line says he hustled them into carriages and off to Duke's restaurant where libations were served. And then they, they waited for the youngsters to finish the game and then they all had dinner. 
And Henry Chadwick is the only sports writer to have a plaque at the Hall of Fame because he was also a, mainly a sports writer. Yeah, he, he was also uh, uh, instrumental in developing the, the box score as well in that yeah. era. So here, this is a, actually a letter from Henry Chadwick uh, to Doc. Um, and I forget what you told me, Marjorie, as to the occasion for, for the letter. Um, there'd been an article in the paper and Henry Chadwick had been named the father of baseball, which was fine with Doc. He never claimed it. And that's very important to know. Doc never claimed that title. Neither has anyone in the family. Um, but Doc had written him to congratulate him. And so therefore this, this letter back from Chadwick. So again, Chadwick just pointing out that, uh, you know, to Doc, you don't need to really call me the father of baseball uh, because that's out of place. Baseball, as he says here, it didn't have a father. It just growed up. And, uh, and that's really true that the game just developed over time. So Doc's final years, he moved to New Haven, Connecticut in uh, 1888. At that time, his two sons were at Yale and Doc moved there uh, to be closer to them and also it was cheaper for them so that they could they could live at home. And you can see here his son, Doc's son Roger had commented that, you know, while there wasn't a lot of talk about baseball in, in the family archives, uh, it was known that he would take up a bat and ball with the family from time to time and, and, uh, and knock the ball around. So uh, it, it's good that he was able to do that. And, and then, he continued, to, sorry, Corky, he continued to make the balls for the boys to play with. And my, on, the, on the recording I have with my grandfather, he says in there, he used to soak the balls in a bucket of water so the leather would shrink and the ball would harden. And then the last quote at the bottom, really just, you know, how, you know, Doc didn't think that highly of his involvement in baseball. As kind of Marjorie said, there's nothing really written in the family papers, but he just considered himself kind of an every, everyday ordinary type of worker. Uh, and with that quote, you can kind of see that. So this is Doc's obituary. Uh, Doc died in 1899. And again, if you wanna read the entire thing, you know, you can go to the website to see that, but uh, very, very highly uh, accomplished write up, I'm sorry, write up of his accomplishments. Um, even in 1899, people kind of knew, uh, knew enough to write uh, that Doc was a baseball pioneer. Um, and hopefully from what you guys have learned in this brief presentation, uh, you'll understand that as well. So, so where do we go next with this? Uh, well, back in 2014, Sabre had given Doc, uh, noted Doc as one of the overlooked 19th century baseball legends. In 2015, we, you know, he had his first crack at the Hall of Fame. He got on the ballot. Um, he needed uh, 12 votes to get in and only got 10. And again, as I mentioned earlier, we're hoping with the discovery of these laws of baseball um, that that's going to be what puts him over the top. And then what would have been uh, a chance to get on the ballot in the winter meetings of 2020 last year, uh, now that got pushed into 2021. And so coming up uh, in the late fall, winter time of this year, uh, we'll, we hope Doc will get on the ballot again and then be allowed uh, to uh, or be voted in to be inducted in 2022. And I, I referenced- Sorry, go, go ahead, Gorky. And I referenced uh, a couple times uh, a website and it's listed there at the bottom if anybody wants to jot that down, it's, it's pretty easy to remember uh, Doc Adams baseball, all one word, .org. Um, a lot of good information out there. And on that page, uh, there is, well, I'll let you talk about it, Marjorie. We um, have an online petition on the website and we'd love to have you sign it to help us get Doc into the Hall of Fame. It is absolutely secure and private. Nobody will contact you. I wouldn't know how. You can contact me through the website if you wish, but no one will ever contact you, nor do we sell the names or anything like that. So you can sign the petition in complete confidence. 
And again, as we wrap it up, um, thank you again. Uh, I think we went probably a little over our half hour, but hopefully people stayed awake and, and, and learned from it. Uh, and again, as we close this out, another quote from John Thorne. Uh, again, you know, John has a strong belief in Doc Adams as a, as a very, very important pioneer of the game. And uh, hopefully uh, this is the time that Doc makes it uh, into the Hall of Fame. And so with that, uh, if there are questions, we'd be glad to take them. Yeah, I've got a question about the, uh, the, uh, the interesting comment you made about the bases being magic. And um, I, I'm really excited to learn where the, where, the, where the 90 feet came came from. But was there, do you, to the best of your knowledge, was there any rationale for, for making it 90? Because it turns out, as you said, a fraction of a, of a yard longer and your batting averages go down a fraction of a yard shorter and that they're gonna go up. And it, it seems like no accident that even today after a hundred and some years later, we've, we still have got 90 feet. Is, was there any indication at all how that 90, that came about? I, th I have two theories on it. Number one, Doc had been playing the game for almost 20 years. So he had lots of experiences with the 42 paces. Number two, his father was a mathematician. Doc was a mathematician. Doc even helped his father in future edits of the arithmetic and the accounting book. They almost collaborated on them. So Doc was a math genius. And I think those two combined, because in the Sporting News interview, he says that he did the calculation. Ah for 90 feet. And I think it's a combination of his experience with the game and being a math genius. I'm sorry to say his great granddaughter is not, but there it is. <laughs> you know, so that's the end. That makes, what's interesting there a, Ollie, is he could have done the math and, I, and I'm, I'm joking here a little bit. He'd done the math and it came out to 89 feet and he's like, yeah, let's round it up. <laughs> let's round oh, it up to 90. <laughs> <laughs> that that's that's certainly more than a, just a plausible explanation. That's that's quite quite reasonable. That that yeah. makes a lot of sense. But but it is yeah it it is it's turned out to be one of the most <laughs> ingenious numbers to come out of a baseball rule that that ninety feet. I'm curious. I, it, uh, so Thorne has written a brilliant piece on the Saber website about Doc, um, and I have both the books about. Chadwick and Cartwright who are in the Hall of Fame and he's not mentioned very much in those books unfortunately but who if who is it what who is it mentioned Doc is not mentioned that much in Chad the biography of Chadwick or the biography of Cartwright he's mentioned uh and mentioned as a, a as an important figure but I'm wondering if Corky or you or Marjorie are collaborating on any kind of book about Doc because there isn't a book about him I mean it I just, I'm just impressed by, I didn't know a lot about him. I've read a fair amount about 19th century baseball, but just a, a humble guy who really did do, do a lot to develop the game. I'm, so thank you for your presentation, first of all. And uh, I'm glad to learn more about him. And then I, reading uh, Thorne's piece on, Sabre, on the Sabre website, it's, it really, it's great. So I wonder if anybody's writing a book about him. Um, no. In, in, in a moment of bravado about five years ago, I entertained it for about five minutes. And then I realized we don't know enough. I mean, pretty much what I've told you tonight, there's some other things I could have added about the personal side of Doc, but I've pretty much shown you everything we know. He didn't leave a trail because he wasn't boastful. He grew up a, a very strict congregationalist, which if, you, if, you, if you're from outside New England, you might not know that branch of Christianity. Well, but, I, I'm, a I'm a United Church of Christ minister, so I know it very okay. well. <laughs> well I, I am a congregationalist, an independent congregationalist church, but they are not a boastful crowd. 
It is not at all in the DNA to put yourself forward. So I think that's a part of it. Plus, honestly, his children and his wife were more important to him. And I really do hope when I, if I get to the other side, that these are some of the things I can ask him. I've got all sorts of questions for him. We have an essay that my grandfather wrote in 1939 about his father, but it really doesn't tell you anything more than what I've already, than what we've told you tonight. It's on our website as well. I mean, everything you've seen here tonight and more is on our website. And what's, uh, what's interesting, is it Tim that asked that? You know, Doc played, most of his playing days were the mid forties, you know, to the, maybe some into the early sixties. And in that era, there's not a lot written about the games, uh, you know, statistics wise. And that's why I say, I don't know really how good of a player Doc was. And so to, to try and write about his playing prowess is really, really difficult um, just because of the era he played. Um, you know, guys like Harry Wright and George Wright that played in that era, but then played later, you find more information, but guys that played in the sixties and before, you know, other than Creighton, who was such a wonderful pitcher, it just is hard to get good information to really do a complete story about him. And that's unfortunate. By the way, Harry Wright started out as a shortstop on Doc's team in 1858. That was his first playing season with the Knickerbockers. And that of course was before he went to Ohio. Hey, Tim, if you're interested in a really good book, John Thorne wrote this book that's 10 years old, Baseball in the Garden of Eden. And right he covers, behind me. And he covers Doc pretty well in this book too. Yeah. Anybody else? What? I don't want to be. Well, if, do other people have questions? I, I mean, I was I was curious about in that uh, that old timers game that he played catcher, which was not an easy pl position to play in the in the nineteenth century. So, if he took a ball in the face, he could heal himself. But well, I was noticed, <laughs> so to speak. I don't want to be rude about because I'm old too, but. My guess is whoever was pitching was lobbing it in. <laughs> yeah. They're, they're, you know, they're, they started to pitch swifter or faster in the mid fifties, but I'm saying if, you know, if these guys are all in their fifties and sixties, when they're playing this, uh, this uh, reunion game, they're not bringing the ball in that fast. Um, and so playing catcher in that kind of a game isn't as dangerous as it would be when the balls are coming in straight and fast, but um Somebody had to play catcher. <laughs> well, you could certainly take you could take it off the bat, though. <laughs> yeah. Corky, I've played some vintage baseball, and it was some. They, it's also called the behind. That sometimes was my favorite position because you didn't you weren't right up on the batter. You'd be back a ways, hoping for a foul ball that would bounce one. So you spent a lot of time diving for these balls to hope that you can catch it for an out. Yeah. So so, so, so you, you you weren't on top of the batter like they are now. Yeah, and that's that's because when you played, you played restricted running. You didn't allow stealing, and that's what most, unfortunately, most vintage clubs do, is they restrict the running, and therefore you never get to see the catcher be the position uh, that he's capable of being. And when you say behind, the behind was the area where he played, not the actual person. Yeah. He played behind the batter is where that came from, and some people would call the catcher the behind, which is not, that's an anachron, that's anachronism. So, um, but yes, if you're just lobbing the ball in, there's no reason to be close to the batter at all. You just stay back and hope to get that foul tip on the bound. Mm -hmm. As you get older, that's a easier position. You don't run as much as you do in the field, so. Yeah, yeah. good points. Who's on the committee that's uh, making this decision? Nobody knows, it will not be announced the the ballot will be announced first. I'm trying to remember from last time, late October, early November is what I'm remembering. And then about two weeks before the actual vote, then they announce who's on the committee. So there's no way we can lobby anybody. So I'm just out there 
talking to anybody I can possibly talk to about duck. Because you never know. I've talked to people in the supermarket <laughs> that had Yankee caps on. So <laughs> I'm shameless. And I always have one of my doc cards with me to give them. Please go on our website, she says pleadingly. I have a newsletter that will go out with the recording of this meeting, uh, a little bit about the meeting, and I will include the website on in the newsletter so everybody can go out and look at it. So. Oh, thank you so much. I appreciate that. I really do. We're over 2,000 signatures now. I'd like to make, I won't, but I'd love to get to five by the time the ballot comes out. Well, let's see, we have uh, 21 of us on here. Well, we had 22, someone dropped off. So there's 19 with that, without you and Corky. So if 19 of us go out there sometime in the next couple of days, uh, we could increase the numbers right there. Yes, it and just tell took less than a minute to do. of your friends. Yeah, it took no time at all. It's right on the front page of the web page. There we go. Click Thank it, you're you done. So much. Just did it. Yeah. Thank well, you, and it. it is absolutely secure. Absolutely safe and secure. Thank you so much, whoever it was. I didn't see. Was that you, Reverend? Bob. Bob. Oh, Bob. <laughs> that was Thank Bob. You. Sorry. Yeah, you bet. Thanks. I'll be signing. Me too. Thank you. Yeah, I well, I hope every everybody's team has a good season. Mine as well. And for those that uh, may not have noticed, I got Doc on my, my vest here, mm -hmm. along with some 19th century baseballs and, and one here over here that I made, if I can get to it. Um, I had this material made up and my wife made a vest out of it. So I just took a bunch of pictures and uh, sent it into this company. They sent me the material and um, she made a vest. Did you ever make anything, Marjorie? No. You still got it. <laughs> I was going to, I was going to have somebody make it. I can't make it, dear God. It would look like, I don't know, like a tarp if I, if I were to try it. So um, just, if, if you weren't convinced before that I'm a doc nerd, there you go. <laughs> Maybe I should just send it to Brenda and ask her to do it. Well, she might. She was uh, kind enough to do mine. Uh, Karki, we're, we're starting to get into show and tell on these meetings. Uh, okay, this would be the second one. But after our joint chapter meeting in which uh, Sean Gibson showed us the trophy, from Josh Gibson's father winning the MVP award in the Puerto Rican Winter League, his favorite baseball memory and one of the few baseball things that Josh Gibson ever kept. You said you have the pictures of the baseball rules behind you there. Can you manipulate your camera or computer towards that at all or? Uh, it's kind of got some glare. Yeah. That is not quite actual size. It's close. Because yeah. I did see them. I got an email in January of 2016 saying, you're uh, going to get an email from someone you've never met. Open it. And the person who sent me the email I trusted completely. Long story short, I went to an office about three weeks later after I signed the confidentiality agreement that is still in effect. And out on the table were spread these 14 pieces of paper. The first three, I instantly recognize it as Doc's handwriting because I have about a dozen letters written by Doc in the 1890s, no mention of baseball. Don't get excited, anyone. Um, and so I've seen them all and it was, it was quite a moment in my life, one I won't forget. And uh, they had a representation of them at um, the Library of Congress three years ago. And Is the man who bought them, I'm sorry, go ahead. Oh, there's Corky with his baseball. Be careful how you say that. I'm showing my baseball. <laughs> I said that, Corky. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I have, a, I actually have a handmade baseball from every year that has a, um, you know, as the rules changed over time, anytime it changed, I've, I've made a baseball for that. And I've also made some of the different patterns that I've seen. And I was uh, fortunate enough to get in, invited out to the Baseball Hall of Fame for a Sabre uh, 
Saber discussion uh, presentation uh, to talk about how the baseballs were made back in the 19th century. So that was my very first ever Saber group meeting. That's kind of cool. That's kind of cool. Are you, are you signed up for the one in April, Corky? The Zoom for for the 19th century committee. Oh, I have not yet. No, is it virtual? Okay. I think so. Is that Joe Williams? I knew that was you. Joe, wave at me. Oh, come on, Joe. <laughs> Turn the camera on. I see. I see your, your duck. <laughs> We're going to open it someday, right? We're going to yep, open this I, next December, right? We sure are. We sure are. That is Joe Williams, who is on my first nine of my team to help me with doc. As is Corky. Hi, Joe. Hello, this is Hello, how you doing? Marjorie, Marjorie you're gonna, you're, excuse me, you were gonna talk about the guy who bought the, or the person who bought the. Oh. Uh, long story short, I got in touch with him after, oh, about a year after the laws sold. And uh, it turns out he's a lawyer and we had a nice conversation on the phone and I asked him what his motivation was. And he said, well, I'm a lawyer, so I love the law. He says, I'm a longtime baseball fan and I love baseball and I love American history. And this is the first piece of baseball memorabilia he's ever bought. And he said, probably the last, cause he had, he had to ask his wife's permission to mortgage the house so he could buy them and uh, everything's fine now. But yes, I'm not sure what's going to happen to them next. They are not on display at the moment. I am pleading to him to display them in New York City because that's where baseball grew up. That's where they were written and the New York Historical Society would love them or the Museum of the City of New York and could probably do a wonderful exhibit on baseball in New York if they chose to, but obviously it's not up to me and they're in a safe place. So that's all I care about. But I got to tell you, gentlemen, holding that 1857 document, those three pages of docs was quite an, exper quite an experience, quite an experience. Yeah, there were some tears in the corners of my eyes thinking, why didn't you do this a year ago? Where were you a year ago when I needed you before the ballot came out? But there it is. Any, any chance you can get them to maybe just display it in the meeting room, wherever they're gonna meet to vote? Oh <laughs> do no. We have the display there. <laughs> well, I will be happy to send them a facsimile, uh, happy to. Um, no, I think, Considering their value of 3.26 million, I don't think that's likely. That was at the time the third highest paid for any sports memorabilia and the second highest paid for any baseball memorabilia. It has now been eclipsed by yet another Babe Ruth uniform. How many uniforms did that man go through? He has more uniforms than I have clothes in my closet. And believe me, I got clothes going back to the Nixon years in my closet. So, yeah. I, so I think we're now down a peg to fourth, but I don't care. I don't care. It's still the most paid for a baseball document at 3.26 million. And no, the family didn't buy it. I kept looking under the couch cushions for extra change that night of the auction, but couldn't come up with enough. And I did mention in the art in the presentation, this is one of the math books that Doc's dad wrote. This is from 1838. Um, so it's what, 30 years after the first edition, Marjorie? Yep. Yeah. Like oh, first one was about 1809. We have one, the family has one. The, the cover is a shingle. Doc's father also wrote a book of geography where he pontificates about countries all over the world which the family always was amused by because Doc's father was never west of Buffalo, New York or 
east of Boston in his entire life. So we still don't know about how he wrote about South America and Africa and Europe the way he did, but that's much harder to find a geography book. We have two of them now. Okay, with the new math that we are experiencing in this country, and I fear helping my grandkids once they get past fifth grade with math, uh, how, how tough are the questions in there? Or is that something most of us would understand? Oh, they're horrible. <laughs> they're horrible. Well, they go on forever. Yeah. There is one problem in there about nine little boys arguing over a bag of sugar plums. And A gets one third of what B had, and B gets two sevenths of what D had. And this goes on and on and on. And you're supposed to figure out what everybody ends up with at the end of the fight. And I've given it to many teachers of mine over in the, in the years past. And none of them have ever been able to solve it. So yeah, that arithmetic book terrifies me, absolutely terrifies me. I'm still looking for the question where if, if a train leaves the station and goes 42 paces east and another train leaves the station and goes 42 paces south, how far is it between the two bases? <laughs> and the answer is 90 feet. I just don't yeah. know how they. <laughs> oh, you're way ahead of me, Gorky. <laughs> but, no, I, that I, DNA, I, I, anyway, gentlemen, I thank you all so much. Thank You've you, so Marjorie. Kind. And I thank you so much for your interest. And again, I hope your teams all have a wonderful season. And Joe, nice to see you. It's been a couple of years. You like my hair? Yeah, I do. Do you like mine? Oh, God. I'm going to need international harvester if I ever get a haircut. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's you about guys time. Know you're a special group because you got to see Marjorie. Normally, she's just a black square. Yeah. Yeah. It's by nine o'clock at night, I'm in my jammies. I'm, I don't have makeup on at nine o'clock at night. I did it for you guys. Are you impressed? <laughs> and very grateful. Thank you for joining yeah. us, Marjorie. You added a lot to this. Yeah. Um, Thank you, everybody. A uh, couple of reminders real quick. Our book club book this month that we're reading is K by, I don't know the book here, K, The uh, History of Baseball in 10 Pitches. It's a very, very interesting book. Uh, I don't have a March meeting, and that book club meeting is March 31. I don't have, uh, it looks like uh, we were going to have uh, uh, um, Anna McCalvey with the Brewers as our March guest talk about the team beforehand. Adam is swamped and having family come here to Arizona. Uh, and so he's, we're putting that off till later time. So I'm looking for what we're gonna do in March yet. April 14th, we have Ron Rabinovitz on, who was uh, Jackie Robinson's pen pal and lifetime friend. And, and it, it'll be a whole different look at, uh, at Jackie Robinson. So that's just a couple of reminders of things that we have going on. Um, we need to sign off. There's another group coming on after us, and we don't want to hog up the, all the all the Zoom t uh, uh, footage out there. This was Thank great. You. Thanks a lot. You oh, bet. Thank you. Good night. Thank, Thank you. you. Good night. Bye. We're all cheering for Doc to get in. So. Thank you. Me too. Yeah. Me too. Bye now. Bye. Bye. Bye.